It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Uh, looks like the 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 post convention bump, uh, pushing Harris into the into the right direction. Seeing a pretty sizable. I had predicted three four percent. We're seeing five to seven across the polling from what what we're looking at, and and that's a good sign. It's a sign people are paying attention. People like the vision, the positivity, and and moving forward. Uh, and this idea, as I've been saying for a while, uh, I think people want their government to do something. And to do something positive. And as I've said a number of times, I am a supporter of activist government. I am a supporter of using our government to actually make people's lives better. To do the things we cannot do individually, to do them collectively. We can solve big problems. We can do great things. And we have in the past when we come together and use our government as the tool that it is to do the things that we want. We could end homelessness. We could end child hunger. We could end poverty. We could end any number of things if we wanted to. If we had the vision, if we had, well, the will. What we've been sold over the last 40, 50 years uh, on the conservative side is hooray for me, the heck with everyone else. I got mine. The one who dies with the most toys wins. Greed. Good. And I recently had a conversation with a, with a dear relative who, look, I love her dearly, but she's fully consumed uh, the Trump poison. She's partially how I knew in 2016 that Trump was going to win. When I returned to my hometown of Cleveland when my grandmother passed, she was one of the people who was all on the Trump train then but it wasn't because of the racist, the homophobia, or any of that stuff there. That was always there. It was because of the, the vision of what the country was going to be. Going to reshore manufacturing, going to bring those good union jobs back. People were going to have hope and opportunity again. It was this vision of what, what could be. Now, again, all of the segregation, all of the, you know, the putting people back in the closet, all that, all that stuff, yes. But it was the economic frame, too. And so she has fully consumed it. Uh, now here she is in her mid to late 70s and is surrounded by the right wing message machine, TV, radio, emails constantly, snail mail. I'm always getting photos. This is what I got in the mail. Uh, you name it, it's there. Constant contacted, constant, con constant contact. And sold the hate and division frame constantly. Uh, it is their stock and trade. And usually when we have these conversations, I, I gloss over a lot of things. I let her say her latest you know, right-wing talking point, and then I, I shift the discussion somewhere else, anywhere else. Because, look, I do respect her for what she means to our family, uh, what she's meant for me over the years. Uh, and honestly, I, I'm not into taking down a, you know, an elderly family member who, who is having some tough, some tough times health-wise, other stuff going on. Not my thing. But... The other day, couldn't help myself. Uh, she called Harrison Walls communists and then socialists and you know every other ist under the sun. And I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. Uh, you know, you grew up during an era where we were probably the most socialistic. The, the home you grew up in was built with government intervention. Uh, a lot of the, the World War II post-World War II housing was done with public-private partnerships. There were little Levitt towns all over the country. Federal money going into building, you know, good, solid, low-cost housing so that the people coming back from war could have somewhere uh, to buy a cheap house, got a, you know, cheap loan through the VA. It, it encouraged home ownership. It encouraged that, that, that rising tide. That idea that of the, the American dream, you get the little house, the white picket fence, you have your 2.3 kids, my grandparents had three, car in the driveway, chicken in the pot, you know, all of that stuff. That stuff we grew up 
believing was the American dream. And I said, look, you know, you grew up in one of the most socialistic times. Most of these programs, these safety net programs were developed by that generation because they didn't want to go back to what their childhood and what their parents went through. This is this is ultimately and this is where my my vision for this country comes from. It comes from political. It comes from experience. So when I talk to people who, when I was a kid who were in their 70s at the end of their lives, saying how difficult the Great Depression was, how difficult it was at the at the beginning of the 20th century, and how we have it so much easier now because government did these things, I couldn't help I couldn't help myself. I, I had to point it out. I go, look, you know, the reality is, is you lived through the the greatest time uh, of this country to be a worker had strong, incredibly strong unions. You had, you know, government policies that actually tried to make lives better and were more responsive to, to, to people on both sides of the aisle. And, it, you know, it, it, it kind of ended, well you, you, well, you know so much more than, than I do, Big Shot. And I'm like, no, that's not it. It's a matter of, I see us in a, in a moment right now of having the opportunity to go back to those days, to return to that idea that we can, through our government, solve problems. Because her, she's fixated on immigration. I go, look, we could fix the immigration problem, sort of. You're never going to end it because, look, as long as you're surrounded by desperation, people are always going to want to get here. But you can go about doing it in a way that isn't as disruptive and isn't as destructive to families coming here. We want people coming into this country. We need people to come into this country to provide that entry-level labor that most Americans don't want. And that's you're not allowed to say that, but that's the reality. And it's how we've prospered. The first generation comes in, they do jobs nobody wants, and their kids do better, and their kids do better. It is the American dream. Sadly, corporations and big money interests have, have attempted to quash that. So when I saw this Kamala Harris ad talking about the idea of using government to encourage home ownership and the fact that she wants to build 3 million new homes and talking about her life experience, this is what I love about Kamala Harris and Tim Walz. It's their life experience that's driving their idea to make change. She talked about her as, as a little girl uh, and her family renting. And how her mother had to save for, you know, more than a decade to buy their first home. And the pride that came with buying that first home. That pride of, of, of ownership and, and community, being part of something. Uh, that's, that's incredible stuff. And in this ad, she talks about, look, they're gonna, they want to build 3 million new homes. Now that's, of course, you know, this relative would be, that's socialism. Yeah. Kind of, a little bit. It's kind of us as a community going, we, we need more housing. Uh, we need to encourage public-private partnerships where the public benefits through, through private, private means. It's smart policy. It's good stuff. She talks about taking on corporate landlords, something that, again, my, my relative didn't have to deal with. And also taking on monopolies, something that really went on during this relative's lifetime. So, you know, I, I go back to this and I say, um, and this is kind of where I ended. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a society that thought like, like they did when you were younger? Like you used to think that community is important, that government can help and can solve problems, can make lives better. Wouldn't that be great? Instead of promoting someone who is, well, for all intents and purposes, only about himself, and seems to be kind of losing it. And I look at this, this latest statement from uh, Trump at one of his campaign rallies, where he says, quote, uh, I was sort of a hot guy. I was hot as a pistol. I think I was hotter than I am now. Uh, I, And I became president. Okay, I don't know. I said to somebody, was I hotter before or hotter now? I don't know. Who the hell knows? <laughs> yes. that that. He's not rambling, though. Not, not rambling. Which, 
this is what we want in the White House? Someone with no idea, no plan, no vision, no, no clue? And all about himself? I think November is a pretty simple, pretty simple list. But talking about hot, uh, I'm, I'm, here's the segue. <laughs> uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the unfortunate heat-related deaths uh, that are happening across the country. Uh, my Teamsters Union fight to help uh, alleviate some of that and what maybe we need to be doing as, as a country to help protect workers in the workplace. Quick break, right back. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So you may remember back in July, the Biden Department of Labor released its proposed heat standard rule uh, with the goal of protecting some 36 million workers from, well, what are really significant heat-related illnesses. Um, we'll see if that gets finalized, to be honest. I'm, I'm not quite so sure. Uh, and we know if Trump wins in November, it's going to be quashed by anyone he appoints to OSHA or the Department of Labor. So, again, another reason why uh, elections matter. But we've been seeing a lot of media reports here lately. Uh, one UPS driver dead in Texas, another one almost dead. We've been seeing these stories popping up more and more. And these are just the ones we hear about. Uh, there are no federal laws yet, no state standards that I can point to that specifically protect workers from heat. And in places like, oh, I don't know, Texas, where local municipalities, local cities, and Florida, where they did pass some heat, heat standards, you had the state come in and overturn them. Not the kind of place we want to be moving for. Uh, so when I saw this story over at Mother Jones, uh, uh, talking about some of my Teamster brothers, or one of them passing, uh, because of heat-related illnesses, uh, we got to get her on to come talk with us. That's why I've asked Serena Lynn to come share some thoughts on her most recent article over at Mother Jones, where she's a reporter. Serena, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me, Rick. So walk me through uh, this story. I mean, I, I look at this and, and it's it's tragic. It's horrible. Uh, it's something that I believe can be prevented. And I know the Teamsters contract uh, is, is moving in a direction to address this, but we're not there yet. Uh, tell me about w what's going on. So I think last year's contract negotiations made a lot of headlines because there was a promise that the UPS drivers would finally see air conditioning in those brown package trucks. But there have been some struggles with actually seeing air conditioning on the flip side of things. And workers also told me that this year amid new record temperatures that it's really like the production standards that are making it difficult for them to stay safe in the heat. No, you know, I remember, you know, because I followed the UPS contract uh, very closely here on the program as a as a Teamster. Uh, I keenly aware of what's going on there. And I said at the time, this is a great step forward, but it's going to take years, if not decades to implement because it's it's new vehicles being purchased. And I remember in the freight industry where I'm at, um, it took years to get new trucks to have air conditioning. So that changeover is going to take time. And of course, the company is they're going to drag their feet on it, as we've seen them do. Yeah, and the other thing is that the UPS contract negotiations were some of the first to sort of explicitly describe heat training and promise that employees would be able to follow the best practices outlined in those training. And what certain sectors of the Teamsters are saying is that a lot of employees don't even know that they have the right to those protections. 
like being able to take breaks whenever you feel overheated. And part of the part of taking advantage of the rights in the contract is, you know, feeling brave enough and protected enough in the workplace to do so, even when supervisors are pressuring you to keep up the pace. Now, this is something I, I like. I'm glad you brought this up. It's something that I say all the time about being a member of a union. You have some bit of empowerment to protect yourself, to protect the public, to do what's right because you've got the union backing you up. Uh, and I'm 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 sad to hear that there are Teamster members out there, there are union members out there who don't feel that same kind of empowerment. Um, and it's something I think the union's going to have to work on, uh, especially uh, given that you know, it's going to get hotter before it gets any better. Um, but I look at places that don't have unions. I look at places that don't have that union protection or the ability to say, no, I need a break. And, you know, there's where we need federal laws. There's where we need to organize more. Uh, but we got to protect them as well. Right. And I think that something that the Teamsters bring up is that, you know, they're colleagues over at FedEx and Amazon where they work for largely contractors and can't even have difficulty forming unions, um, they're in much worse shape and they have like little recourse to go turn to if they do feel like they're being mistreated at work around the heat. I gotta tell you, I, you know, I, I, when I hear that union members don't have that, that same sense of empowerment that I've been fortunate enough to have, because look, I've been in these situations where it's really stinking hot working in some of these trailers. And if you need a break, you, you, you protect yourself, which is what the company is saying, as I understand. Well, you know your body, you're the one who should be you know, policing yourself uh, while still pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, this is where the individual, if you have the protection, without question, should be protecting yourself and your family. Right. And I think that that's something that union organizers are trying to push back against and say that, you know, the more people that file grievances, the less you'll be able to even be singled out, because what are they going to do? Retaliate against everyone in the workplace. But changing the culture takes time, I think. And that's what they're hoping to do. Yeah. And look, I, I know how employers will pit employees against each other going, hey, you don't want to let your other part of the team down. So you better pick it up here in this hundred degree heat. Uh, and, you know, never mind your safety. Uh, it's it's interesting how they manipulate to get people to act beyond their their own their own personal limits. And uh, in, in these heat situations, I don't think it's a great thing. Now, you in your article, one of the things that it was a great article, and I hope people will take a look at it. And we'll get links out on social media how they can look at it. Uh, one of the things that that I found interesting is the company pointed you to someone in Phoenix, um, who's on their safety committee, and and you know about some of the things that they're doing. And and I I, I was stuck on the lunchbox checks. Uh, I I was stopped by the fact that they were giving us water. Oh, that's nice of them. And sometimes fruit and and doing lunchbox checks to make sure that we're, we're eating right. That I got to tell you that that just stopped. That's the that's what they're doing. Right. This is something that organizers with Teamsters for a Democratic Union had told me is that. Maybe sometimes in its heat safety and also in its reminders to employees that UPS is trying to shift some of that responsibility back onto you as the worker and to make it your fault if things happen and to make it your responsibility to monitor yourself for symptoms of heat safety. But of course, this culture is the product of company-wide policy and expectations that are like pushed by supervisors everywhere. No, look, I, I to a degree, I, 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 I agree with them that you have the, the responsibility to make sure that you're okay. Uh, that you don't put yourself in, in a position of danger. And I've always said the contract and the union is there to give you that ability to do that. But ultimately, uh, if you don't provide a workplace that is safe, it doesn't matter how much self-policing you do, um, it's, it's, it's gonna be really hard on the employee, given the fact that, as you point out in the article, in you know, 100 some degree heat, you've got these guys running and these women running in and out of these trucks two, three, 400 times a day, rummaging through the back of the package car with no ventilation, no air, no anything. Of course, you're created, no matter how much fruit you give them, it's still an unsafe condition. Right. And UPS is a company where employees say that their supervisors are very focused on productivity me metrics. 
like how many packages delivered per on-road hour. And so things like that, which obviously come up in a company where you have to climb through the tiers of employees, are they going to come up and they're going to create a kind of constant pressure, I think, to to keep up the pace. Now, is this something that you think, and I, you've, you've, you've spent time on this topic, is this something that a federal law would help, state laws, uh, something, I'm, I'm a big believer in union contracts and people being empowered by their contracts to solve problems locally. In your sense, you know, which way do we go to protect working people in the workplace? Which, which in your reporting, which seems to be the most effective, would you think? Like you said earlier, I think that there's a sense that it might be a few more years before we see that federal OSHA regulation. And of course, it's so dependent on the upcoming election. And I think that it feels to me that that it the power does lie in collective organizing because OSHA rules function much like the union's grievance process, right? Like you have to be willing to take some kind of personal risk and, and file a complaint. And employers are often able to, those those fees through, those fines through OSHA are not always super punitive. And I think that on a broad level, the union organizing gives you a sort of structure of power to hold a company accountable. Yeah, I was just reading an article here before before we, we talked that said, you know, the, the most recent um, Teamster member who passed, uh, because, died because of heat-related illness, OSHA fined them $66,000. And I'm going, um, I, I don't know that that's, I don't know that's sufficient. Sorry, uh, the, someone's family is is losing their breadwinner. Uh, you know, someone's family is losing their their their, their father, their mother. Their, uh, they're losing an integral part of who they are. I don't know the $66,000 fine is anywhere near, uh, anywhere near enough. Right. And something that experts pointed out to me is that those kinds of regulations only come after the fact. We only see... We only see action after someone has already died and those things are irreversible, obviously. And so the union through contract negotiations might be able to change workplace conditions before it gets to that point. And that's why like, I think a lot of people are looking towards how the UPS contract folded in these explicit heat protections as a potential model for other groups moving forward. Now, as you pointed out earlier, the, obviously the Teamsters negotiated uh, air conditioning into the new vehicles that will come online. And as I said, when that came out, look, uh, they're going to hold on to those old vehicles as long as possible. They may do some retrofitting of trying, putting a little fan in there, because I know there are little tiny fans in there now. Um, they may try something, but it's still not going to rise to the level uh, that needs to be done. But what do you say to the person who goes, you know, the company just can't afford it. You know, it's, you know, it took, it took years to get here. It's going to take years to get out. Uh, what, what's the response to that article, that, that argument, or do the folks you talk to, uh, do they get, do they understand that? Do they have an argument for it? Yeah. I think that one thing that experts say is that, well, things are going to become hotter and hotter and sooner or later it's going to affect production and ultimately affect companies' bottom line. And so if you don't account for heat safety things now, then later down the line, you're going to see perhaps more workplace deaths and it's going to become inevitable. Like it's going to have to happen sooner or later. Yeah. Well, the old pay me now or pay me a lot more later, I guess. Yeah. And then how many people die in the process? So in the, in the, the workers that you talk to, how many of them think that this is a serious issue for them? Because I know a lot of, I have a lot of friends who are like, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's somebody else's problem. I'm, I'm better than that. Do you, did you get that sense from, from people? I don't think so. I think that broadly the feeling is that, especially in places like Texas, everyone is suffering. Like no one is immune to the heat and especially the more senior employees certainly have higher health risks. And the fear is that, you know, people isolated in their own delivery trucks will think that this is just a them problem, that they should be sleeping more or drinking more water. But really like it is a collective company-wide problem. And I think that that's starting to take effect. Yeah, it's systematic across the industry. But, you know, I see, you know, uh, I, I see on social media, you've got people saying, well, look, you know, Amazon drivers who are making a quarter of what the, the Teamster drivers are making, they get air conditioning. Right. I think that some other reporting has showed that the Amazon con contractors that provide the vans, the air conditioning is often broken. But yeah, I think that 
it might feel difficult from inside UPS where the Teamsters have, you know, won them an incredibly strong contract and that they're paid relatively high compared to other delivery drivers and have great benefits. But I think that like, this is like where the next line is going to be drawn. Like this is just going to herald more labor disputes over extreme heat and heat protections because it's going to impact all of us sooner or later. No, I'm right there with you. But also for me, this is a political issue. And this is where I look at Florida. I look at Texas, where local municipalities had passed some bit of heat standards uh, for construction workers. And you have a state government uh, like DeSantis, like like Abbott, uh, who have come in and destroyed those local regulations by by having uh, these these preemption laws that they pass. And I think politics plays a huge part of this. You know, again, I go back to this frame of which side are you on? Are you on the side of the workers or on the side of the corporations? And I look at these two examples, clearly you've got state governments on the side of the employers. Right, and I think that we're sort of seeing at a national level level other pushes to improve workplace protections, like um, congressional leaders recently just pushed the U.S. Postal Service to, like, ahead of the OSHA of rule proposal even being adopted to to take into account those own proposals into their workplace. No, and that's that's what we need. We need proactive action by our government so that someone else doesn't die. Uh, last line of question I've got for you, you know, in looking at this uh, on the on the scale, when you talk to these these workers, how important is this? Uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, is this is this immediate? Is this something that they go, well, we need to be moving towards? Is it something that, hey, we're addressing? Because uh, I get the sense that, you know, they sent you to this this guy in Phoenix who's like, oh, no, we're doing what we can. We're checking. We're giving him fruit. Um, any sense? Yeah, I think that especially for workers in the Dallas area in Texas, there was recently also another death where there's an autopsy. Um, incoming. And it feels like to them that there's a death every year and that maybe it'll become more frequent as it gets hotter. And so it feels very immediate. It feels like a very urgent and life-threatening issue for them. Yeah, no, I I, I feel it myself. As I'm getting older, uh, working in those conditions, uh, I, I, I think this is a really important issue. Uh, but Serena, I appreciate the time. Hope folks will take a look at the article uh, over at Mother Jones. We'll get links out on so- social media. You can check that out. UPS drivers want historic heat protections. Say the company hasn't lived up to the, that promise written by Serena Lynn. Uh, Serena, I appreciate you taking time for us. Good stuff. Thank you, Rick. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, is this an issue in your workplace? Is this something that you think should be addressed by our state, local, federal governments? I want to hear it. Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. Quick break. Right back. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1934. That was the day 7,000 white and Filipino lettuce workers in California's Salinas Valley walked out on strike. Salinas was the lettuce capital of the world. The division of labor in the valley was largely ethnically based. Filipinos did much of the field labor, while whites worked in the packing sheds. At the time, Filipinos made up 40% of the total agricultural workforce in the Salinas Valley. They had founded the Filipino Labor Union a year earlier. White packing shed workers had organized into the AFL's Vegetable Packers Association. While the VPA had been reluctant to work with the FLU, they now sought to join forces in strike action. Both unions agreed neither would return to work until both had achieved victory. Together, they demanded wage increases, union recognition, and better working conditions. Losing $100,000 a day, the growers soon imported scabs of all races. They enlisted the California Highway Patrol to arrest striking Filipinos on incitement and vagrancy charges. Soon, the VPA agreed to arbitration, leaving the FLU to continue the strike alone. Some speculated the members were threatened with the loss of their charter if they refused to return to work. The striking Filipino workers continued to organize job actions and experienced increased retaliation as a result. VPA leaders publicly distanced themselves from the Filipino strikers and racially charged vigilante violence intensified. 
It culminated in the burning down of the labor camp where hundreds of Filipino workers lived a month after the strike began. Vigilantes then drove as many as 800 Filipinos from the valley at gunpoint. The strike was officially called off and those that remained returned to work. By October, both unions had won wage increases. I've got those payday Friday grocery store blues. That working class lament is from an old bluegrass song, but millions of working stiffs are singing it today. While many workers have finally seen an uptick in their paychecks, they've been dismayed to see the increase quickly gobbled up by jacked up grocery prices. What the hell? Kamala Harris has had the honesty to call it what it is, gouging. And to put some bite in her bark, she's proposing a long overdue national ban on rip-off pricing by food giants. Of course, this produced outraged squeals by corporate functionaries, but some of the most furious squealing is coming from a supposedly unbiased corner of America's economic structure, economists. A little-known secret of this occult profession is that most economists are schooled by and working for the corporate order, generally hostile to consumers, workers, and other competing interests. One absolute rule they learn is that none of the inequities and iniquities of America's laissez faire land economy are to be blamed on corporate greed. Thus, a whole pack of mainline economists raced to poo-poo Harris's price-gouging charge, asserting that grocery prices have naturally surged due to what they benignly call price-pack architecture. Bovine excrement. Price gouging cannot be perfumed by semantics. It is mass swindling, and people can detect it by its stench. So let's follow that stench to its anti-free enterprise source, monopoly. For the past half century, economists in both Republican and Democratic administrations have looked the other way, allowing food giants to consolidate and conglomerate, shut out competitors, monopolize every aspect of the food economy, and steal. This is Jim Hightower saying, it's that theft that Harris is daring to challenge, and Americans will cheer her on, no matter how furiously establishment economists squeal. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, oh boy, this is going to get really exciting from here on out. We're going to talk taxes, everyone's favorite topic. Uh, but I saw this report that just came out from uh, the, the Penn Wharton folks. Uh, their, bu- their budget model uh, says that the Trump campaign's tax and spend proposal is going to increase our primary deficit by uh, $5.8 trillion over the next decade. And uh, on a conventional basis, they say uh, the, uh, the, fo- the, the, the best case scenario, the dynamic basis, 4.1 trillion. So best case scenario, 4.1 trillion more added to the deficit if Trump's elected. 5.8 on the on the flip side, because again we're going to make sure uh, that wealthy people are taken care of. And this is where I keep saying, Democrats, you got to find your message on the tax issue, tax fairness being part of that. And Kamala Harris is uh, is talking about taxes. I know, again, really sexy, really hot topic, uh, but she's talking about look, uh, we need to. We need to shift this tax code a little bit. We need the wealthy to pay a little bit more, and we need working people to get a break. Seems reasonable to me, and here to share some thoughts on her plan and what this plan could look like, what it could mean. Uh, I've asked Will Rice to come share some thoughts. Uh, My go-to tax guy, he's a a policy consultant with the folks over at Americans for Tax Fairness, americansfortaxfairness.org, the website. Will, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks, as always, for having me on, Rick. So the, the latest reporting on Kamala Harris and this this tax thing uh, seems like to be a lot like what Joe Biden had proposed with some 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 things, steps forward and, you know, child tax credits, some other things to help working families. Walk me through what you understand of this plan. Well, as you say, um, the, the Harris uh, plan basically is the Biden Harris administration budget, the last budget that they proposed um, this spring. Uh, and it's similar to budgets he's that the, the administration's proposed every spring actually. And the 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 nub of it is that they are trying to get uh, the the richest households and the most profitable corporations to pay a fair share of taxes so they can use that revenue to invest in working families. 
and uh, we can go through all the details. But I think if 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 anyone comes away with just one idea, that's that's what it is. That's what the Biden Harris idea is, and uh, we think it's and we think it's uh, great fundamentally what we're talking about and, and again this for me is the old labor frame of which side are you on are you for a tax code that encourages uh, mass cons consolidation of wealth and hoarding of wealth or are you for a tax system where working people aren't burdened because look the one thing i agreed with the tea party people on is working people are taxed enough already uh, maybe we should go after the people who've kind of gotten away with uh, with not paying uh, over the last several decades. And that's the people who have all the money. Seems rational, seems sane. Uh, will it sell, I guess, is the question. Oh, I think it will. I mean, um, whenever they do public opinion surveys in recent years, um, Democrats, independents, and even Republicans say, majorities of them say, the rich and corporations should be high, paying higher taxes. So it's really kind of, old-fashioned to uh to not be talking about that i think it's it's really where the american people are right now and it's um it, it's important that the, their political leaders catch up to them you know i saw the number that they were throwing out as, as the top marginal tax rate uh that the harris folks were throwing around something like 44.6 percent uh which i believe was is the top marginal rate which would be the, would be the highest rate since 1986 but understand historically that's nowhere close to the highest that it's been. Uh, for me, I want to go back and dig up, you know, Dwight David Eisenhower and bring back his tax code. I know that's not possible. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when you hear 44.6, you know, your eyes gloss over. But again, these are people who are with hundreds of billions of dollars. That's right. And that number is a is a combination of several things. The actual top rate would be 39.6%. And then you add in some surcharges on that. But again, yes, these are people who are very, very wealthy and are making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, every year. Uh, and not to get too wonky about it, but that's just the, that's what's called the marginal rate. That's what they pay on their, their next dollar. Um, they're paying lower rates on the earlier parts of their income. So their effective rate would be, would be lower than that. So again, I, I, you know, when people talk about taxes, you know, people get, I've got friends who are angry, you know, and, and look, I, I pay a lot in taxes. Uh, and I do, I do so because I believe it's important that uh, we pay for our community, the community we want. I want good schools. I want safe neighborhoods. I want good roads. I want a strong military. I want all these things. We have to pay for them. But, you know, I don't like the fact that there are a lot of folks who are getting, who are skirting their responsibility to the country. Uh, and I look at those people. There's a list, uh, a Forbes list out there of, of people who, you know, quite frankly, uh, hire teams of people to get away with not paying uh, paying taxes. And then look, I guess that's their right. It's also our right to go after them. So for me, this idea of, of fairness of, of, you know, you know, people with the, the bigger shoulders carrying more water back to the cave for me sells. So the hope is, is that this gets, this gets the attention outside of here. Cause this has kind of been a losing message for Democrats over the years. Cause they haven't been able to get anything done. Well, that's not entirely true. I, uh, uh, President Biden ran on the most progressive tax platform of any candidate in recent memory. He won, and he was able to enact uh, some of what he wanted to do in, in what was called the Inflation Reduction Act from a couple of years ago. That created a minimum tax on the largest corporations, some of which can sometimes go without paying any taxes despite reporting big profits to their investors. It also uh, created a, um, a stock buyback tax, which served the dual functions of curbing the practice of corporations wasting their money on stock buybacks and also raising a lot of money when they do. So, um, and he also was able to restore the depleted funding of the Internal Revenue Service to allow the IRS to go after rich tax cheats. So uh, he won on a tax fairness uh, uh, platform and he was able to enact a, a, a several important planks of that. There's plenty more to do. And that's what's been in his budgets and uh, uh, has now been adopted by the Democratic Party as their platform. Um, and uh, uh, but I think it, it was successful and I think people liked it. And I think they'll like even more uh, the more the closer we move to a state of greater tax fairness. No, and I think it's important to point out that all all income is not taxed equally. No, not at all. In fact, that's one way to look at this I think is useful, is that basically our tax system is not set up right now 
to effectively tax enormous wealth and enormous income that comes from that wealth. If, if, you, if you draw a paycheck, the IRS knows just where you are and how much money you've made. And you, as you know, they're going to take the money out. But if you're a billionaire uh, and you have this huge amount of wealth, um, most of which con consists of, of, of what are known as capital gains, the increase in the value of investments you've made, um, you, you, if you sell those investments, you'll pay tax on it, although at a discount to what an equivalent amount of money that you earn through working would be. Would be. But they figured out they don't even have to sell the investments. They can just go to a bank, say, look how rich I am. Please give me some a loan to live on to pay my bills with. They get a low interest loan and then they can live off those. And the interest they're paying is far below what they pay in taxes. And then when they die and pass those gains along to their heirs, their lucky heirs, those gains for tax purposes magically disappear. So it's that kind of thing. Uh, it's that kind of uh, discrepancy in the tax code or that failing of the tax code that we need to fix. No, I, it, and again, the idea that all income should be taxed at the same, whether you're gambling on Wall Street or swinging a hammer in the in the summer heat, um, mm -hmm. I would argue that the gambling on Wall Street should be taxed higher. But Has somehow we, we somehow we keep thinking that um, oh no, we need to have these rich people keep taking risks because mm -hmm. you know that we need them. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not buying it, but that's what we're being sold. Warren Buffett has said uh, he's never met an investor who is a seriously considered tax consequences it, it, for a winning investment. He says if it's a winning investment, people who who make those who make those gambles, as you say, are going to go for it, and they're not going to say, "Oh, well, gee, I may have to pay a little taxes on this." Um, you know, God bless them. They're very aggressive. They want to make as much money as possible. And all we're saying is that they should share a little bit of those winnings with the rest of us who are doing equally important jobs but don't get paid quite as much. Because I go back to this frame, and I think it's the right one. If you want to live in this society, there's a, there's a cost of admission. If you want to have good roads and bridges and you want to have the infrastructure for these businesses that you're, you're gambling on to thrive and survive and compete, um, maybe the, uh, the, the floor that they're on should be solid. And maybe you should be contributing to that through police protection and fire protection and military protection and all this stuff that, well, it, last time I checked, cost money. Absolutely. And and if we don't have the rich people pay more, that means either all of us have to pay more or we have to borrow more, which most people don't think we should be doing. So there's really one place to look. And it's a very good place to look because uh, the, the, the discrepancy in wealth and income in this country has been growing and growing. We have nearly 800 billionaires now. Um, we have, and these billionaires are spending their money to fly into space and buy bigger and bigger yachts and whole islands and all the rest of it. Um, so just to go back to what I said about the way a billionaire lives, the, the source of their income, the, the way that the Biden Harris administration wanted to address that was they said, if you're worth a hundred million dollars, which very few of us are, it's a point zero something, 2% of the population. Um, we're going to tax, we're going to make sure you pay at least a 25% tax. So we're going to include in your income, the increase in the value of your investments, your stocks, bonds, real estate, everything else. So even if you don't sell those things, if they've gone up in value, we're going to count that. Uh, and that would finally mean that we were counting the rich people's income, which for them largely is capital gains, the same as we're counting wages and salaries for people who go to work every morning. And it, and it would raise an enormous amount of money, half a trillion dollars over 10 years. And we, what, what could we do with that money? Well, we could pay down debt. We could expand health care for people who don't have enough of it. We could expand child care for parents who are going nuts because they can't afford to have anyone take care of their kids. Uh, build more houses, bring down the cost of rent and, and, and home purchases. There's a lot we could do. And, of course, the, the hundred millionaires, the center millionaires and the billionaires, they would still be doing pretty well anyway. Yeah, but again, you're talking about you know solving problems and using government to do it. That's not the frame of, of a certain uh, political party in this country. It's uh, where their belief is government can't and shouldn't do anything. Leave it to the private sector, to the profit sector, so that these folks can make more money. Now, I, I want to take a look at, you know, evidently 2025, we're going to see uh, major pieces of Trump's tax code uh, come to sunset. Uh, they're going to expire here uh, because of that 2017 law. And the, 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 correct me if, if this is wrong, but it's saying that about 62% of households are going to see their taxes go up in 2026. Uh, so I can't imagine that uh, 
uh, that that this is gonna this is gonna be allowed to happen because uh, we're gonna protect the, the very well to do clearly. Um, but that seems like a pretty big jump for working people. It is, and that's why the Biden Harris administration has been very clear from the beginning, from when they were running for office, that they're not going to let taxes go up on anyone who makes less than four hundred thousand dollars a year. So that's ninety eight percent of American households. So they um, have pledged to uh, keep those parts of the um, of the expiring Trump tax law, extending those for for people who make less than $400,000 a year, but letting the parts that are expiring that, that exclusively benefit people making more than that amount of money, let them expire and thereby save us trillions of dollars in lost tax revenue. What was the sense? I mean, I, I know you follow this stuff and and I, w- I never understood the sense of, of having the the things that benefited working people sunset after a period of time. I never got the the, the rationale behind going. Yeah, you, know, you know, in twenty twenty five, you know, these tax cuts that we were going to give to working people, that's going to go. But we're going to keep the lower corporate rates, and we're going to keep the lower rates on on very rich people. I I never really understood the the rationale behind why you would do that. Well, it was kind of an old fashioned shell game. The, what happened was. Congress has certain budget rules. It says you can't uh, increase the deficit more than a certain amount uh, over, over a 10-year period. So um, Republicans in Congress back in 2017, they had a certain amount of money to work with that they could give away in tax cuts. And they wanted to do more than that. So, so they play this trick of saying, well, okay, we're not permanently making these tax cuts. It's just a temporary thing. It's going to expire, and therefore we're, gonna, we're following the rules. But they very purposely made the corporate tax cut permanent and the individual tax cuts uh, temporary because they knew it would be much harder to go back to the American people uh, after uh, you know eight years and say, oh, by the way, we have to keep this corporate tax cut in place because they know the country would would protest because they but but if, if they if they alternatively made the, the the less popular part permanent, then they thought they had a better shot of making the more popular parts uh, extended once they ran out. Um, so it was a political calculation and um, and no one actually does want those rates to go up on, on working families. But there's plenty of money available, about half of it, uh, that, that would, otherwise we would lose, uh, just from allowing the old rates and rules to return for people making over $400,000 a year. Now, I find it interesting in, in Harris's plan, because uh, if you go back to 2021, uh, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we had that child tax credit, which uh, cut childhood poverty in this country in half. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had this tax credit of, I think it was like three thousand dollars for kids over six, thirty six hundred for kids under six. Mm-hmm. Uh, she wants to revive that and also add uh, for newborns a six thousand dollar tax credit uh, to help families, you know, and encourage people to have children. Because uh, as I've been saying, if you want people to have kids, you got to help them pay for it. You got to help them get the you know the food and the clothing and the housing and the the education and the health care. Everything right. that comes along with raising children, which is something my uh, my right wing friends haven't figured out yet, um, is this is this smart policy? Do you think is this something that would would be helpful? Is it, where do you, where do you put this? Oh yeah, definitely helpful. I mean, there's more and more research that 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 highlights the importance of these early years uh, in in children's development, and so the more we can do to help parents. Uh, you pay for the clothes, pay for the child care, pay for all of these things that are that go into raising a child is absolutely essential and a, and a terrifically good investment uh, for our society. So um, I, I think that's that's the good way of using tax policy is to help parents take better care of their kids. Yeah. Now, on the aggregate, you know, as I understand the the Harris plan and the Trump plan on the aggregate, uh, the Harris plan doesn't actually raise additional taxes it just shifts more on who pays and which is where i've been for a very long time um the wealthy have shifted onto the backs of the working class and maybe it's now time for that pendulum to swing back a little bit to the other side uh, they're projecting 63 trillion dollars uh in in collect in revenue being collected over the next decade and again that's not going to increase uh, under the harris plan but it is going to shift who pays what uh, mm-hmm. and i think that's a, i think that's a good thing yeah, I mean, who does it make sense for people who get up every morning and go off to work for them to be paying the bulk of the taxes or for people whose work basically consists of checking the stock ticker to see how their investments are doing to, to pay the taxes? Um, 
rich people, higher income people already do pay a lot of taxes, but but the extent that their wealth and their income has exploded in the last few years, it's completely out of whack. They should be paying considerably more um, and they will be doing just fine as they do. Whereas working families need to just be focused on getting dinner on the table and getting the bills paid. And they should not be the ones burdened with, uh, with paying for all of these public services that rich people, by the way, benefit greatly from as well, whether it's national defense, uh, law enforcement, roads, highways, bridges, ports, uh, the court system. Uh, there are all kinds of things that rich people uh, oftentimes use more of than, than working people. Uh, so it makes perfect sense for them to be the ones to pay the bulk of the bills. Yep, I'm right there with you. Will Rice, I appreciate the time. Policy consultant, Americans for Tax Fairness. Check out their website, americansfortaxfairness.org. Will, always great talking with you, man. Uh, appreciate it very much, Rick. What you do in general, and especially be inviting me on. Thanks so much. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at ricksmithshow.com. Do we go after and dig up Eisenhower with that 92% top marginal tax rate? Uh, I hear rich people falling over as I speak. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at ricksmithshow.com. Right back. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1963. That was the day one of the most important stands for justice and equality took place in United States history. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech to a quarter million people in Washington, D.C. But did you know that one of the main organizers for the march was a man by the name of Baird Rustin? Rustin is often left out of the history books because he was gay and because of his earlier communist affiliations. He was born in 1912 and raised in Westchester, Pennsylvania. He was raised in the Quaker tradition, and his commitment to peaceful, nonviolent protest continued into the Civil Rights Movement. Rustin joined the Young Communist League in the 1930s, a time when communist organizers were some of the few people actively speaking out about racial injustice in the United States. After he left the Young Communist League, Rustin spent a brief time as an organizer for a march on Washington, D.C., planned in the 1940s. This movement was led by one A. Philip Randolph. The planned march was aimed at putting pressure on President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to desegregate work at industries with federal wartime manufacturing contracts. When President Roosevelt agreed to issue an order desegregating these jobs, the planned march was called off. But the idea for the march lived on and became a reality during the civil rights movement. Rustin went on to work in the labor movement. He became the founder and first director of the AFL-CIO's A. Philip Randolph Institute, which focuses on tearing down the walls of discrimination in workplaces and within the labor movement. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. Thank you for indulging me uh, on the tax talk. I know a lot of people, not their thing. <laughs> Uh, not the uh, not the thing that they want uh, front and center, but I think it's an important topic. In fact, we told it's how we pay for things. It's how we get. It's how we get the things that we want. And I go back to my high school government teacher, who, uh, while I may not have done great in the class, I learned a lot from him because uh, I listened. And government is a, is is how we decide who gets what. That's the reality. We have childhood poverty in this country. We have childhood hunger. We have homeless veterans. We have we have all of these problems. We have immigration problems. And the question you have to come back and ask is, well, who benefits? All of this stuff. Who who gets who gets the money? Uh, we're divided and pitted against each other in the hopes that the for the rich people, the hopes that that we won't notice that they're they're robbing us blind. So thank you for the indulging me on the tax talk. I think it's a, I think it is an incredibly important issue that gets far too glossed over for other bits of nonsense. 
Uh, so, but anyway, uh, we just just had the first capital rioter to breach the capital sentenced. And and look, you know, it's only uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's only the the end of August, twenty twenty four. Uh, but Michael Sparks, uh, the first defendant to breach the Capitol, was sentenced to 53 months in prison uh, for felony and misdemeanor charges. And and what the interesting thing is, is the frame that I keep getting from people, that was just a patriotic day uh, that, you know, they were just they were just ordinary tourists because, of course, ordinary tourists decide to drop trow and defecate on, on desks and floors. That's a normal thing to do. And I like what uh, what Michael from California sent me an email saying. He said, uh, just a thought. I've been hearing people saying that as an excuse during January 6th, uh, police escorted protesters slash rioters through the Capitol. Uh, he suggested maybe those police were MAGA or were they just overwhelmed? And, you know, look, uh, I met a lot of a lot of police when we were at the DNC. Uh, one of the popular right wing commentators happened to walk through and like giddy schoolgirls, you saw like 30 police surround them and take pictures and they're sharing pictures, all of their heads down on their phones when he walked away. Uh, not, not really doing their job. So, yeah, there, there are some in, in the law enforcement community who are in that world. Uh, that is the reality. Uh, now, uh, RFK Jr. has come out, endorsed Trump. Shock. <laughs> uh, and what, what's going on is Trump is now saying that he's going to put uh, RFK Jr., because he needs a job, and Tulsi Gabbard on, on his transition team. They're going to be honorary co-chairs of the, uh, the, the presidential transition, which they're going to be the ones who are then going to have to implement Project 2025. Good on them. Going to make patronage great again. And who better uh, than than uh, Mr. Earworm? Uh, speaking of Mr. Earworm, uh, evidently, um, and this is one of those things that makes you go, is it, was there a quid pro quo here for, for RFK's endor endorsement of, of Trump? Because we know on Friday, RFK Jr. endorsed Donald Trump full-throatedly. And then we find out that uh, Trump says that he's going to make RFK Jr. Uh, the, the head of a commission to look into assassinations, uh, you know, assassinations like JFK and RFK Jr. RFK uh, Senior, and and the failed attempt on him. Uh, no mention of uh, Gerald Ford. No mention of of Ronald Reagan. Uh, Reagan was actually shot. Uh, no mention of that whatsoever. Uh, but you know the other two, because hey, you know, a lot of conspiracy around that. And then and then him. And look, there should be there should be a a an investigation into how that shooter was allowed to be there and the failures of our secret service and, and why I'm all in favor of that because I don't want anyone, I don't want any presidential candidate uh, to have to fear for their life because they decided that they're going to step out and, and talk about their vision. It's up to us to decide whether that vision is good, bad, or in, in my view, in Trump's case, horrible, uh, but as horrible as he was as president, the last thing I wanted to see was, was an assassination attempt. That's not how we do things. or it's, And it's not how we should do things. Uh, as, as has been pointed out to me, you know, with, with guns, kind of is how we, we do things in this country. Maybe, maybe we should be looking at that. And I understand there's a potential of the Supreme Court uh, taking up a case on, are we as, as citizens entitled? Is it our right to own an AR-15? You know, I've often said the right to bear arms, you know, can be limited and has been limited. I cannot own a thermonuclear weapon and nor should we allow anyone to do that. Uh, but the argument could be a, a sharp stick is an arm and you have the right to bear a, sh a sharp stick. Uh, we'll see what our, our nine in robes do uh, the, in the next legislative session or in the next judicial session. I want to hear your thoughts, though. Uh, something I said today got under your skin, on your nerves, or hey, made you think a little differently. I want to hear it. Something you agree with, my, by sure, uh, most certainly email me, rick, at thericksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program, podcast, video, uh, freespeech.org. That's where you go to get to video stuff. As always, 
Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you taking some time to tune in. And as always, we'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick Rick at rick at thericksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.